put in a folder and a dust covered box in a back corner of the closet in the Judiciary Committee's office. I challenge them to go back there and find it and bring it out and assign a committee to it. Let's get this done. Yeah. Yeah. It Woo! is important. Yes. It is extremely important. Now going back to the bill and how it defines controlling behavior. According to this proposed bill, and granted, this can change types of behavior. This bill lays out types of behavior to look for. Now, I don't know if you saw or you remember, but there was an interview that was done uh, of me that said, hey, do you think, you know, what do you think about the police and what they did? Well, here's what I think. I think the police didn't have anything to look to. They show up, they look for bruises. They look for black eyes. They look for scratches. They look for those types of things. And not seeing any, no crime here. They don't have a law to look to. Now, let me read you some of these behaviors that had this been a bill, a law at the time, the police officers would have had something to look to and to gauge it. The offense of coercive control of another person may include, but is not limited to, the following types of behavior. The very first one, isolating a person from their family and friends. In and of that stuff, that is not a crime. Next is depriving a person of their basic needs, food, shelter, clothing. The next one is monitoring a person's time. That's done a number of ways. Trackers, PIs, looking through their cell phones, looking at what they're doing online, driving by the uh, job, who you talking to, where you at. D, subsection D, monitoring a person via online communication tools and using spyware. You know, the interesting thing here is when people are married and the police are called to a domestic situation, usually what happens is they're told by the police officers because this is what they get to go to is ma'am, sir, this sounds like a domestic issue. You need to go see a family court lawyer or you need to go file something in family court. Well, the first thing that a coercive control abuser does is take away your money, take away your transportation, and your way of communication and the friends that support you. How are you going to get that? How are you going to pay for it? Going on to the next one, E says taking control over aspects of a person's everyday life, including where the person may go, who the person may see, what a person may wear, and when a person may sleep. Next is depriving a person access to support services and medical services. Next is repeatedly insulting a person including expressing the person's worthlessness. Enforcing rules and activities within the home that humiliate, that degrade and dehumanize a person. Next is forcing a person to take part in criminal activity including shoplifting and neglect or abuse of children. Children are often used as tools, weapons against the one that they want to dominate. They also encourage the person's self-blame and prevent disclosure to authorities. If you tell, this is what's going to happen to you. Next is financial abuse. 
including control of finances and only allowing a person a punitive allowance. You don't need to get your hair done. It looks fine. You don't need to have the money for that. You don't need a new set of boots. You've got plenty. Next is threats to hurt or kill. That's a lot. Threats to a child. Threats to reveal or publish private information or extort the person or a member of the person's family in retaliation by legal or other means. Assault. Most people think of assault plus the battery, assault and battery. Assault is in the fear, someone placing you in fear, raising my hand, my fist to you, you're afraid I'm gonna hit you. That's an assault. Usually what happens after an assault is the battery where the hand or the fist comes down. Assault doesn't leave bruises but it sure does on the psyche of the person who's experiencing it. After that is rape. Non-consensual, of course, that's what that means. Sex, that both parties don't agree to. There's no past when you're married. Preventing a person from having access to transport or from working taking their car away from them. They lose their job, they can't go to their mamas, they can't, you know, go see their friend who's their confidant or the one that they can lean on. Can't take the children to the daycare to get to the job. Transportation impacts a lot of areas. Those are the types of behaviors that are listed by this bill. I have developed what's called MICA's list. Micah's list tracks what the bill says. And we put together things that she journaled, diary, or put together to say happened. Please keep in mind that John Paul Miller has never been arrested for domestic violence. He's never been arrested for any harm against Micah. And everything that's put in here, quite frankly, is her words on paper. I have no reason not to believe her, but in fairness, you need to understand that what I'm about to read are things that Micah alleged in her writings and journal. I'm not gonna go through the ones that we just went through. I'm gonna go through the ones that I suggest and recommend that the Judiciary Committee consider asking the subcommittee that hopefully will be assigned very soon to consider. General emotional abuse. All of this together is emotional abuse, psychological abuse. It's, it's psychological warfare. Ignoring requests and commands to stop, to leave me alone, go away. Cruelty to your pets. That one's used just like children. Destruction of property. Key in cars, slashing tires, whatever that may be. Destruction of the supporting evidence that the alleged victim had in mind to use against the perpetrator. Misuse of legal documents. Sending letters such as cease and desist to threaten to file lawsuits or threaten to do other, take other legal action is an improper use of the legal system. I don't know how many people would ever get a letter from a lawyer that would not be concerned or afraid. That's what we do when we send those letters. We threaten to sue you. Next, I would suggest is misuse of legal documents. Excuse me, I'm sorry to say that. Misuse of law enforcement. 
calling the police for no reason. Gaslighting, saying something happened that didn't happen. Telling somebody they could do something, then turn around and call the cops on them and tell them that you didn't say that. Whatever. That's such a waste of time of taxpayers' money. The law enforcement need to be doing other things than that. But it's intimidating. And then you find yourself you're having to defend yourself against something you didn't do. Right. Misuse of the legal process. Filing divorce actions, dragging in the court, dropping them, filing them again, dropping them, filing other papers in the court. Using the court system not for legitimate purposes, but for purposes of intimidation and control. Another factor should be adultery, promiscuity. Another should be stealing a person's identity. Folks, do y'all know in today's time, technology, we can control everything from our phone. We can start our car, we can slam on brakes, we can turn up the heat and we can turn down the cold. Our domestic violence statute is archaic. We gotta get it up to times, up to today, standards, taking into consideration all the things and ways that a person who wants to control and intimidate can use. I would refer to that as cyber or technology abuse. Medical abuse, making a person take medication that they're not prescribed, making them do other things, denying them access to medical care. Lots of different things that could happen there under medical abuse. Spiritual abuse, spiritual abuse. The next one I'm saying church abuse, but it really should say position of authority abuse. If, you're in a, if your um, loved one works for you or you work for them, they have a position of authority on you. Fire you like that. You don't like what I say to do? You don't do what I tell you to do? You just lost your job. And then whenever you go and do all this list of things that I want you to do, I might let you come back. That's also financial control. Phone calls to everybody to explain everything. Called your mama, called your sister, called your brother, called your daddy, called your lawyer. Called everybody. Explain it. And the last, of course, from my perspective, is physical abuse that doesn't leave marks. The shove against the wall, the hand around the throat to hold against the wall just long enough and tight enough where you can't move, but it won't leave a mark. Holding you down, won't let you up. Those are physical abuse that don't leave marks. The police come, they don't see marks. They can't do much. This will give them the tool that they need. It needs to be education about what coercive control is. Someone who's not lived in it or been a part of it sometimes has a difficulty wrapping their mind around what this is. Coercive control is basically like a psychological warfare. It will damage the very soul of a person. It will make them doubt and lose their self-confidence and especially their self-worth. And they'll give up. They'll give up on being happy. And they'll survive and trudge through day by day or maybe they won't. What this family wants you to do is to help this. We want Micah's law, we want the coercive control bill to be looked at, taken seriously, put some time into it, and somebody make an amendment to add your name as a sponsor and make an amendment to call it Micah's law. And what can you do? What can each of you do specifically? Sometimes we feel like we don't, it's not, we're, we're not effective, we can't do certain things. Getting this law on the books will help. So, what we have done,
show you. These are purple folders or envelopes that have all been stuffed and addressed to every member in the House of Representatives that are on the Judiciary Committee. There's also one in there for every senator that's on the Judiciary Committee. So y'all look for your purple envelopes. Now, what the public can do here is hold your legislators accountable. What have they been doing? Take a look at it. Contact your legislators, both in the House and in the Senate. Let them know you're mad. Let them know you're on board. Let them know that you are their constituent, and if they want your vote next year, they better get this done. You can call them. Their numbers are published online. The website to go to is www.scstatehouse.gov. If you don't know who your senator is for your district, if you don't know who your house or who your representative is in the house, you can go on that website, put in your address, and it'll tell you who that person is. So I would encourage you to reach out to whoever is representing your district in both the Senate and the House. But don't forget those who are on the Judiciary Committee. So go there and you can look for the Judiciary Committee, both in the Senate and the House. You'll get the names of everybody there that's, on, that's serving on that committee. They make it very easy. They have a place online there where you can submit an electronic message to them. You don't need to go and do all of this work. You can simply go online, fill out the form, submit it, and they'll have it. If you want to do a letter, but you just don't know what to say in it exactly, I have created a template form that is available for anybody who would like it. You can use it just like it is, or you can change it up, or you can use it as inspiration and write whatever you want. So please get those letters out there. You can also send them an email saying the same thing. Those email addresses are published on that scstatehouse.gov website. And then next, just put it on your calendar every now and then. They have a thing called tracking that bill. Track that bill. Thank you to everybody for being here and for your patience. I know everybody was looking forward to seeing the drama in the courthouse or in the courtroom. There was never going to be any drama in the courtroom. It is not a live testimony type of hearing. Nobody got on the stand. Nobody would be cross-examined, that kind of a thing. It's simply a packet of papers that would be presented to the judge while we sat in silence, while she reviewed the information and made her decision. So we do appreciate you standing out here in the heat too and waiting for us. And the restraining orders that went out today, where were those for Micah? Because you represented her, so where were they? No orders had been signed by any judge at this time, or at that time. How come they didn't go out for Micah though? Uh, there was a request for restraining orders for Micah. But unfortunately, Micah passed away before we got to court. But the request was there. So, as I said earlier, what we would like to do is keep the focus on the coercive control, i.e. Micah's law. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has with regard to that. We'd like to keep the focus there. If you have questions for the family about anything else, we would ask that that be done at a separate time. Yes, sir, in the back. This relates to Micah's law. Do you believe the SC justice system failed Micah? The current SC justice system. Do you believe that Luke Rankin, who is head of one of the leaders of the Senate Judiciary, he's the head, um, who right here represents this area, could he have done more to see to it that this reforms that we've been calling for are already being put in place? Because we're calling for them. Yes, that's a very good question. So, as it always is, there's two sides to every story, right? There's the side of the story that the position that the family takes. That, that, that Mr. Miller is somehow responsible for her death, whether that's directly or indirectly. Obviously, it's been declared um, self-inflicted, so that 
is off the table. There is questions about whether this type of behavior would drive someone to take their own life. We do not know what was inside of Micah's head. If, of course, her husband takes the position that she had a mental illness, that, was, um, that she didn't have her medication, and that the reason she did what she did was because of a mental illness, uh, specifically bipolar. Um, so to say that the judiciary failed her, because I don't know what really got her to that point, I have some suspicions, but I do know this. Based on all of the stuff that I have reviewed, and the things in the journals that Micah left in my possession, um, tell me that a lot of these behaviors happened, assuming that what she said was true, and I have no reason to believe it wasn't. If the law had been in place at the time, she could have reported these types of behaviors, and the police would have been able to look to that particular law assuming that when it went to the governor for signature, that it would be in the same format or better or harsher or whatever. So I think that that is a possibility, but to say for certainty is not possible. What I do know for certainty is that there are people who are being victims of um, manipulative and psychological abuse uh, that's often overlooked and uh, this bill will help every one of those people, and that's husbands, wives, women, uh, and um, husband or men as well. So it's not it's not gender specific. This happens um, on both sides. Thank you. Regina, do you know if this is in this kind of law is in other states? This kind of protection? Yes. Thank you very much for asking that. I actually meant to touch on that. When I mentioned uh, about WBTW doing their um, their special on uh, this type of abuse back in uh, 2020, I believe it was. Uh, interestingly enough, go look it up. South Carolina made headlines uh, for being one of the four states that was considering coercive control. Of the four was South Carolina, Hawaii, Connecticut and California. Guess who's got laws on their books? Probably three years old now. Hawaii, California, and Connecticut. South Carolina doesn't. What did we miss? Attorney Ford, um, if Michael's law gets passed, would it apply retroactively? Um, I wouldn't say that it would. Of course, it's up to the legislature, but I'm pretty sure that would not be fair to anybody anywhere. Usually whenever a law is passed um, or a bill is passed and signed into law, uh, it usually comes with a, a, uh, an effective date. So there would be some date that would be picked and from that date forward, anything that violates that bill could be considered um, you know, part of it, if that's a crime. Would, would yes, you have to? I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. This is another part of the problem, is whenever you are married and you're being harassed by your spouse uh, and you can't get into family court or whatever, most people think about, hey, when somebody's uh, harassing me, we all know you get three events. You go to the magistrate court and ask them to issue a restraining order tell this person to leave me alone, right? That works really well for your neighbor or your whoever that's uh, bothering you because you can show, hey, they texted me, I said, don't text me anymore, and right after that, they sent me this long diatribe, okay? So whenever um, people who are married go to the magistrate court seeking that type of restraining order, they can fill out the paperwork, but then the judge will most likely look at it and say, this sounds like a family court matter. Why? Because you're married. And so they feel that the jurisdiction really belongs to the family court. Now there is a small exception to that. If you look in the law, it says that the magistrate court can issue those types of restraints like family court can, um, whenever the family court is closed. <laughs> um, so 
usually the judges like to stay in their lane. They don't want their orders overturned and that sort of a deal. So if it's a possibility to refer them to a family court when they're married, that's what they're going to do. Uh, she just went to the wrong place for that. And no, I wasn't representing her at the time, but I wish I would have been. So, yes, ma'am. Um, so can you talk about the um, testosterone allegations? Um, the I'm not going to talk about any of those things. Well, what portion of the law, uh, of Micah's law, would apply to those allegations? Okay, so as it's written, um, would probably be assault. Okay. Uh, the suggestion that I asked to be added would be um, medical abuse or that type of thing. It's also a form of battery whenever you administer somebody something against their will. Uh, battery, actually, you know, people think of a battery as it leaves a bruise. If you do this to me, and I don't like it, that's a battery. If I told you not to touch me, and you did, that's a battery. You accidentally bumping into me going down the hall is not a bad. It's an intent. Yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, to the family, I can't even um, come up with the words to describe. I, um, my sorrow for you all. I don't have a lot of money, but I've been praying really hard about how to help you all. I think I've come up with an idea, but if one of y'all would like to um, talk to me about that afterwards. I would be happy to tell you my idea. I just don't want to put up my hands on the money. That way y'all can put it towards your legal fees, uh, like law, um, food and laundry, Thanks. water, um, whatever you want. But Thank I don't you. want my, my hands on the money. But that, I, I do have a, what it think to be a Okay, thank you very much. That reminds me of something else I should have uh, told everyone. Is we have set up the email address. It's called Justice for Mica Tips T I P S. Um, that's of course it was set up for people to send in tips. But if you want to send us an email to that particular email address, uh, and so we can get your contact information, and we'll be in touch with you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Just the wall. Is it equal the same thing as the domestic violence? Like when the police show up, can they say, okay, we can arrest right now because we have this law, or do you still have to go to family court? Very good question. Thank you for that. Okay, so this law, if it goes into effect, will be considered a felony. The suggestion is that it carries up to 10 years in prison. With it being a felony, police can't really lock up on site. If the police see you committing a crime and in front of their very eyes, of course they can arrest you for that. Whenever you convict, whenever it's this many levels of elements and proofs that are required, what would happen at that point is the police officer would say, huh, this seems like this might be coercive control, and then go to a magistrate who can issue a warrant if the, if the magistrate determines there's probable cause. So if the magistrate compares to the facts and things that are being relayed to them by the officer, then the magistrate would have the ability to issue that warrant and uh, go from there. Yep. Just a clarification, S927 is the bill that you support. You said it wasn't quite right, but you said it was a good start. That's the bill you want amended to be Michael's law. If he wants to change his new bill, if he wants to be out to you, you want to craft this legislation. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I had actually, in the letter that I'm sending to them, uh, making some of my suggestions. I'm happy to read it to you if you want to hear it. Um, the, uh, the clear goal of the uh, bill is to avoid any person from being psychologically and systematically abused. Uh, I had come up with 16 additional factors that I felt like were missing from the bill. I also believe that the bill needs to include mandatory ankle monitors uh, for those who are arrested. Obviously, the person is, you know, most likely following you around and doing things to intimidate you, riding by where you are so that you see them. So I think an ankle monitor would be a good uh, part of the condition of a bond for someone who's been arrested for that charge. I believe that it would be prudent to require that a portion of those fines and those fees and those ankle monitor costs and anything else associated with it should be allocated to a domestic violence fund. 
We used to have CASA here, Citizens Against Spousal Abuse, and the funding sort of dried up. So it's always a question of how do we pay for these things. Uh, so I think that the uh, percentage of the fines and the costs and things associated with that type of charge should be allocated to the domestic to a domestic violence fund. Uh, I think the funds should be collected um, and paid to use as salaries to hire at least one attorney in every county of the state of South Carolina to offer free legal representation to victims of domestic violence. Coercive control is actually a part of the domestic violence statute that we have. I mean, it will be a part of it. So it's not a separate thing. It's actually requesting an amendment to the South Carolina domestic violence laws. In other words, adding another section to the title. Uh, the additional thing that I asked for in there is, um, well, or it said basically is to try to get some representation because people are confused by the legal system. Um, and so it would be really nice if they could count on uh, legal representation whenever they don't have any money to be cut off financially, they've been cut off, you know, transportation, etc. So those are some of the things. I also think that they should look at things like ramping up uh, first offense, second offense, third offense, uh, those types of things and making it uh, an enhanceable crime. Just a couple more, we're all baking out here. You spoke you. about how the criminal justice system has ruled Mika's death a suicide. Does the family intend to use the civil court system to hold, or to attempt to hold Pastor JP civilly liable for Mika's death, Mika's death? Uh, as I've stated, stated many times, uh, we're collecting information to determine whether that will happen. I have been retained for that specifically, but right now we're just in a research and investigative phase. Thank you. May I say something? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Even if, because obviously this law is taking time, how can we make them aware? How can we, I mean, we're doing it now, but they need to be held accountable too to be more, per, per, you know, perceptive, yeah. you know, of what's going on. Um, and, you know, sometimes if somebody has a lot of money in the community or a lot of ties, they will uh, take sides, maybe. Um, so, that's just my question. Yeah, thank you for the comment that the um, abuses, you know, victims are, you know, um, it's somewhat rampant. So, it's not just about MICA. So, no one's being forgotten. Um, it's all about victims. Uh, we're just asking for it to be called MICA's Law because so many people have paid attention to this situation all eyes are on it and people are paying attention and we really want people to become educated we want our police to be educated they're not trained in it because it doesn't exist in law they're trained to look for the things they know in law that are a crime okay so when we say hold the police accountable as i stated before when they arrive on the scene and you know spouse is saying she took my wallet and won't give it back and has my keys and won't let me leave the house, then the officer is going to defuse the situation, okay? And it's a domestic situation. People get in fights, you know, fights. I mean, it's part of being married, too. It doesn't mean it's all abusive, but sometimes it gets, you know, to a place where someone calls the police because they want something to happen. And so the police will look at it and say, well, I don't see any bruises on you, sir. I don't see anything like that. Did she hurt you? You know, that sort of thing. So it's 
so if it's not a physical abuse thing or a physical um, manifestation of the abuse, the police just don't have anything to look to. So would this bill be made into law? Uh, of course, I would imagine that there would be some form of training because it would be a new law mm -hmm. that they would have to be familiar with and learn how to identify the elements that are associated with it. I think what, you had. Yeah, when, when a marriage occurs, it obviously the spouse has a lot of protection. So you sort of alluded to uh, how they would say something like, oh, it's a domestic matter. How exactly does the law change how, how a married couple is, how complaints within a married couple are handled? Other than, I mean, obviously it's new protection, but does it change regarding marriage? Right. So I don't think anybody should be afraid that if I call the police saying, you know, that this particular thing is happening when it's really um, may not rise to the level of a crime, you know, she's yelling at me, she's yelling at me, won't leave me alone kind of thing, whatever is going on. Um, with this bill, what happens, as I said before, the police cannot do anything about it. What they do is they will look at the totality of the circumstances, okay? It's gonna require that there be different things. I think if you saw me say, when the police show up at your house 15 times, something's going on, okay? But the police don't have anything to look to to say, hmm, well, what does it mean when you go to the house 15 times, okay? That would be an element to prove coercive control. That would be one of them. So, and, and the law needs to, to figure out what the combination is or how many things. I think there's a suggestion of two behaviors you know, I don't know what it'll end up being. Maybe that's too many, maybe that's too few. Um, I don't know. Okay, so one it more, is super hot. One and, more quick, um, quick question. Regarding protesting, I was at the protest last Sunday. Is that helpful, not helpful? Could you guide us there and what the family's wishes are as far as moving forward with things such as that? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I haven't spoken to the family specifically about that, but I, I think I have an idea of what they would say. They want your support here. You don't need to be running around Mr. Miller's house and his back door and across the church, okay? We've already got the message out, and Micah's life is going to matter, regardless of whatever the reason was of why what happened to her. Her life is going to leave a legacy, and her life is going to help people. That's where we need to focus now. We need to focus on that because the other things that happen or may happen, um, we can't undo those. We can't undo those things that happen, allegedly happened to Micah. But what we can do is going forward and being supportive that hopefully there won't be any other victims that got to this level. Uh, if, you know, that's where we need to focus now. Is it true that the FBI is investigating? Yeah, we're getting away from coercive control bill with that question. Can you say the email one more time for the job? Justice for Micah Tips, T I P S. At gmail.com, I apologize. So, current state law states that if you want to get someone convicted for stalking and harassing police, you have to show two or more patterns of that within a 90 day period. It sounds like Micah, I mean, she made both. speak to that. I, I'm not the, the authority that was there to, you know, police officers uh, make judgment calls on when to arrest someone. Um, if, they're, if they're not sure uh, or if they see, you know, different types of behavior that require an issuance of a warrant uh, or they've learned of um, different types of behavior that may uh, issue a warrant, then, then that's what the police, that's where they're, that's what's available to them to do. Okay, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, we do appreciate your support. We appreciate you standing out here in the hot and bearing with us. This is an important thing. You want to make a difference in this world. You want to make a difference for your neighbor, your loved ones, whoever's sitting on the pew next to you in church or wherever you are. Uh, a lot of people suffer in silence over this. And this, if it gets passed,
should be an empowering moment for those who are victimized. Thank Justice you. for Micah. Basically.